Uh, as you are aware, I am usually asked to speak about things of life here for the period between when you come to the Lord and when you die. And because we are a youthful church, that span is very long. And if you're not careful, you can actually endure life as a Christian while you live here. But you can also adopt attitudes and gain insight that help you um, have life in abundance. Part of the challenge is that some of the things we speak about, you already know. And have a perspective about them that is likely to be correct. But this sharing helps clarify your thinking more and more. The topic today is the impact and results of sinful choices at a personal level and as a nation. The impact and results of sinful choices at a personal level and in the nation. Choices do have consequences. Very often, we don't relate them. But today I'll try to speak to that a bit. Next Sunday, we shall talk about insights in navigating as a Christian through chaos and storms, if you like. As Lorraine says that in this season, in the country you feel like there is almost more drama than life. How do you as a Christian navigate that space? And our last lesson in the series is going to be how to create and expand impact as a Christian and as a church in this navigation. The last time I was here on related things, I've been here many times, but when I had related things, we were looking at the elections of 2022, and I'd been asked to locate the place and role of a Christian, a Bible-believing, heaven-bound person around here in the democratic life of the nation. And I spoke about the tenets of democracy and the imperative they have for a Christian, the importance of a Christian to vote. And some of the people in uh, Bamulaka, Ruaka, that year didn't vote because they hadn't taken votes, registered as voters. Uh, and this series was coming rather late. They didn't have a chance to um, respond by registering. And I must add that it is important to always ensure you are a registered voter because voter registration continues all the time. And it happens most likely not very far away from where you live. Then we spoke about the considerations you make when you vote. It is not just a ritual that we engage in every five years. It ought to be a thoughtful application of your faith as you vote in determining who you choose for whatever level. I wrap that series with a question, what do you do if what God told you about the choices that are available, and you obeyed and voted as God told you. And in the last election, God seemed to have spoken a lot. And every candidate had champions and prayer warriors who are hearing God speak about them being our president, even though the slot is only one. What happens when your choice doesn't go through? And we spoke about that. And I said that uh, it's very difficult for a person to be chosen president and to carry out their manifesto. And they are reviewed every five years, and we are two years into the election uh, season, three years to go, and we are back to make a, a full comprehensive appraisal, 360 degrees. Unfortunately, a lot of people are already completing the evaluation two years before the end of the term and assigning a mark to completion of the <laughs> electoral cycle three years ahead. But I said for you to be able to do that well, if you are married, you need to make a manifesto with your wife. 
And if you are single, it's a little harder, but uh, also sit down and create a manifesto and tell yourself, for the next five years, if God keeps you, what is it that you want to accomplish in your corner and circle? Because it's so much easier to criticize other people, but if you are trying to achieve something yourself that you have set out as a manifesto, and you realize the challenges that come with trying to make such accomplishment, you might have more grace. But because you are not elected and you don't earn from holding the political office that the elected officers have, if you don't make your manifesto, you might just waste your five years being a cheerleader and an observer of what others are doing when you're really not doing very much yourself. My wife and I do have a manifesto. It doesn't uh, include things that uh, create earthquakes and lightnings, mundane things, but uh, we are on course and we keep trying to pull ourselves back to it and it is ex exciting. Today I share God's word on a very special day called Mashuja Day. And I said I'll make a little fuss about that. Um, and you'll find some of the things I'm saying may not be very inspiring today. But because I have a series, I'll come back next Sunday and the other Sunday, those things that excite you, I'll say then. Today, <laughs> I will want to hold us onto a reality check. Mashuja Day is the day when Kenyans have set apart time to look at our lives and our history and celebrate individuals, usually, who have made a huge contribution to Kenyan life, especially the ones who fought for independence and that's the ones that have followed during independence who, because of the choices they make, the sacrifices they have made, the struggles they go through, the energy they exert, on the situation around them, they actually create an impact that benefits the country. So we celebrate them. Now, a lot of you think that Kenya is in a very bad shape uh, often. Kenyans are also very gifted in grumbling and complaining. But except for the contribution of these patriots who have held this country together and brought it to where it is, things may have been worse. As you know, they are worse in some countries. A few names, Jomo Kenyatta, who was uh, the first president of independent Kenya, uh, famously called the father of the nation. We celebrate his life, and he spent many years struggling to negotiate for independence, and some of the years in jail. One day he was described by the colonial rulers as a leadership unto darkness and death. But uh, he didn't give us that much darkness when he became president. Jeremiah Oginga, Oginga, Oginga Odinga, who really had such sound philosophical views about independence. Remember, Mubebero asked him to form government when Kenyatta was in jail, and he said he won't until Kenyatta comes back. It's ironical that they didn't chum well for a long time, and within a short time when he was deputy, no, vice president, they fell out and never repaired in Kenyatta's lifetime. But he has an iconic place in Kenya's history. Tom Boyer, who was one of the leading lights in the younger generation, who lost his life early. Robert Ouko, who we do not know what he would have become, one of the brainiest fellows that served this country with brilliance um, and the powers that be didn't like him, so he was killed. Moi, some people have a lot of bad things to say about Moi, but he held this country for 24 years. I was one of those who didn't think he was such a great fellow until Kebake, who I thought was very great, came. And he did one term. And as he was fighting for his second term, the country broke apart. And I couldn't reconcile how these brilliant Makerere economists, uh, at one time celebrated as one of the top 100 men in the world, could lead a country that goes into the election-related violence at which thousands of people may have died, half a million people displaced, uh, IDPs across. Uh, and, and I went back and said, this feeble man called uh, Moi, there is something he knew. 
Even though we had many troubles in his time, we held together. Even though we had clashes that I think he instigated sometimes, somehow he knew how far to go and when to stop them. But this one of Kebaki required God to literally come from heaven to help us. But he made a contribution. And Kebaki and Uhuru, Archbishop Gitare, Moge, Modri Tagato, Wanjao, those were guys of the PCA and Anglican who really helped us very much. But you can talk about people like Chandaria. I don't know how a man who is not reputed to have had a lot of education was able to create an industrial empire that employs thousands of people and provides most of the goods that we use in our homes. Um, was being reminded uh, about Wangari Madai. Uh, you can't list all, but again, this girl from Nyeri, who was a professor, in her journey, she didn't have all success stories. You remember, her marriage broke apart at a time when it was very stigmatic uh, to be divorced in Kenya. And a big statement that if your marriage breaks apart, your life hasn't broken apart. You can still pick up pieces and fly. And she became the first Nobel Prize winner in Kenya. And she has contributed a lot to the greenery of this country. Spoke about James Mwangi, the group managing director of Equity Bank, uh, who literally revolutionized banking. Uh, banks in Kenya then, a lot of them Zugu based, were very contemptuous on uh, Kenyans. I'm one of those people who um, received a letter at some point because I was having difficulty keeping a substantial balance in the account. You are told the way your account is behaving, we shall close it because you're not bringing money. <laughs> now, if you remember the kind of salaries we used to earn, the kind of money banks wanted you to retain, I didn't know how people found them because there were a lot of money. If you're asked to have a balance of 10,000 and your salary is just about that, how are you going to keep a balance of 10,000 unless all you do is work and keep money in the bank? So this is what we are celebrating today as a nation. And I think we must thank God for our heroes and say, except for the men and women who have held this country together and made sacrifices, what you think is not pleasing and good would have been much worse. Other nations have gone down the drain which didn't have men and women like we have had who held us and held the country together. You may want to give a clap for them and just say thank you so much that God gave us such people who we can celebrate. And as you celebrate Mashuja Day today, the context is not as pleasing as we would love. Um, you know about the high cost of living that is putting everybody out of breath, the high taxes. This government has a very high appetite for collecting taxes, to pay debts, but also to do other things, uh, laws of jobs. Many people have become jobless and have slid below their previous economic level, a lot of them below the poverty line. And the shame of it, there are some Kenyans who have become homeless. In this new dispensation, some people can't get a roof over their head. They cannot pay that rent of 3,000 shillings in Kibera and Madare to have a roof over their heads. They are shocked that we eat and drink and drive big cars when they are dying of hunger and lack. And if you ask a lot of them, they will tell you that the government has brought them there. And I do not excuse the government because it is its responsibility to ensure that its people don't live in squalor. What about the restlessness that was epitomized by the Gen Z's? The sleaze and public display of wealth of people in government, some of whom we know, <laughs> they really were not that rich until two years ago. It's not possible to tell how in two years some people can have the kind of wealth they have. I was telling the other service that one of the memorable things I will not forget is one of them on TV telling us that he has a disease, 
at mimi niko na ugonjwa ya kupenda vitu za baikali he has a disease of wanting rather expensive things when he buys a belt it's a 90000 shillings belt now 90000 shillings you will buy four suits that are amazing and the suit seller is likely to throw in a belt that works <laughs> and you see the frustration of kenyans is you seem to be doing so well when we are doing so badly and we were in the same place before you became a minister and other things what is this miracle that you know how to do and you haven't taught us that makes you so amazing and now we are in the middle of uh, two quagmires as a nation that uh, we shall learn a lot from one even though ruto won the election with a convincing majority in an outfit called UDA and a majority is needed so that you run the country his majority is not adequate he had to import the people from ODM and bring them into government and give them incentives i hear even money <laughs> to the principal so that he can have an even more convincing majority unfortunately that gang is asking for its pound of flesh and some of the problems we shall have is getting people who have been out of government almost as a profession coming into government and having access <laughs> i suspect that before the time ends ruto will find a way of kicking them out because the demands they make on him are very huge then we have this contention around a deputy president who must be impeached as an emergency even when he's in hospital so that he <laughs> he leaves this country cannot survive if if Gashagwe is deputy president now the guy who can't handle a Gashagwe deputy president presidency when he was deputy president was much worse in fact i saw a a video those things that keep circulating a guy was saying that he can't understand how a mlevi president was able to hang on with a saved deputy <laughs> and now he cannot tell how two people deputy and president who are both saved and their wives are <laughs> confirmed intercessors they, they cannot live together <laughs> that is kenya for you <laughs> many kenyans are out of breath only two years into a five year term and think that it should be stopped our opinion polls show that kenyans think we are going in a wrong direction 71% or there about people think kenya is headed in the wrong direction if you try to find out the approval of the president so far the polls would say this is the worst president we have had but i am very gracious <laughs> i'm very gracious and i have this hunch that by a stroke of luck and genius he may just reverse that perception and by the time three years are over we may be singing praises for him surprised that the lord sent our way such a man let us pray for him that he may have such success how do we almost always find ourselves in a hole where we only appear to dig deeper as a nation and never seem to come out of it our de democratic heritage allows us to choose leaders every 5 years and in the new constitution we choose many and constitutionally these are the people who should fix our country and fix our problems and we choose them every year 5 years ugandans are very envious of us because they hold elections but they tend to get the same president what <laughs> however many years pass lorin you don't know that uh, museveni became president when i was in third year in university since then i'm a father of 3 and a grandfather of 6 all that time you got us don't know any other face they know only one and their neighbor on the south how long has he been around rwanda 
about 20 years. Somehow they hold very democratic elections that turn out a vote of 90 something percent approval for the election. Every five years we choose our leaders. So we can actually say that every five years we decide who we want to lead us. And we choose them on the basis of the tasks that we think there are to carry out. And we choose them in conviction that they have the skills to do the job that is there. And we choose them with an understanding that their hearts are right. And we can rely on them in navigating through leadership. They will make the right decisions as opportunities come. The Bible is very harsh on this subject. And some of the passages that I found, I would have talked about, I didn't think they were nice and kind, so I looked for something better. Proverbs 29, verse 2. The NIV says, When the righteous drive, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, the people groan. KJV, Ken, uh, King James Version says, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. And Solomon is trying to say, really, the people who lead you are the ones who determine whether you'll spend time mourning or whether you'll be a rejoicing group. Now, in his day, they had kings. You came to be a king by birth. We are better off than in his day because we choose. Proverbs 29, 12, if a ruler listens to falsehoods, all his officials will be wicked. Again, Solomon is saying the attitude and the capacity of the ruler to distinguish between truth and falsehood and to be loyal to truth is significant in determining whether the battery of people who work under them will be good people or bad people. But when a leader listens to falsehood, uh, the officials become wicked. That's why it says, by justice a king builds up the land, but he who exacts gifts tears it down. And that is about bribery. When you get corrupt leaders who take bribes in the course of their duties, and they have a discretion to make, the land finds itself at a curse. I hear that there are businessmen who have said they will not trade with county governments. Because they say, for you to get the contract, you first bribe. And some of them say it's not enough for you to bribe to get the contract. When you have bribed and it is coming, you must load money <laughs> onto your contract for you to collect for the people who exercise the discretion. And then the money that you have been contracted, in many cases, you must give a share of it without reference to what it costs for you to give the service. Give a share. Can be told 10%, 20%, 30 30%. Some officials will even tell you 50%. Then you ask, the road I was supposed to build, who, which I quoted for, for this amount, and for which I was asked to collect X for a guy. And now my money, a share. How am I going to do that road? Now some business people are powerful. They can navigate all that. I hear some of them say, now they have given up because when you have done the work, you can't get paid. And you know there are people who have been auctioned. When they have done work for county governments, they are categorized as pending bills that can last forever, and county governments are spending money every year. Where the leaders want gifts, 
an a polite way of calling them bribes, the country just goes under. And this thing cuts across from the village to Harambe. I didn't say Harambe what, eh? <laughs> By justice, a king builds up the land, but he who exacts gifts tears it down. A ruler who lacks understanding, Proverbs 28, verse 16, is a cruel oppressor, but he who hates unjust gain will prolong his days. Now, from these passages, you can tell that a nation rises or falls on the quality of leaders it has. The leaders who ascend to elective offices in a democracy determine how the land will stay. And it doesn't matter whether they are educated or not. If you look at some of the heroes that we celebrate, they didn't have much education. But they had enough understanding and knowledge that you must sacrifice to build your country. And if you die in the process, it is worthy to die for your land. It does not matter what tribe they come from. Some of the guys who have lost their lives saving Kenya really were not bothered about their tribes. Men and women become heroes. Young and old become heroes. But the even bigger tragedy is that the people who are sent to power gain a discretion to appoint officers to serve under them at their discretion. That would be the opportunity to repair the limitations in the ultimate leaders at every level. But who do they appoint? Usually those who are like them, that they went to school with, who come from their tribes, who share, share their values and their principles, so that the dominant vices or the dominant virtues of the people who are sent to power are the ones that spread and infiltrate the national fabric under their leadership. And so the malaise that Kenya is grappling through which I have tried to outline and descri describe, is a malaise that is historical and cumulative. From the colonial days, to the Jomo Kenyatta regime, to the Moi regime, to the Kebake regime, and Uhuru regime, and the one we have now, our leaders have some, done some good which we can celebrate. But somehow, their vices have also played out so that every leader has left us with some baggage to sort out. And the ones who follow, even though they campaign on a manifesto of clearing the debris that has been left, they actually quickly and urgently, as an emergency, work very hard to accumulate some more baggage to be left to be sorted out by the people who follow. And so you have a sick country, a sick public service, generally. And the corruption and mischief is very difficult to change and control because it runs very deep. The private sector is not spared. The church is not spared. I will not go into that, but from the passages we have read, you will see the outcomes are clear of the kind of leaders we have. What happens when the righteous rule? And it's very pleasing to see what righteous people can do to their country and to their institutions. The people rejoice. I guess that their hearts confirm that mambo iko sour. Hukombele, mambo iko sour. Things are okay. And somehow, when you come across a righteous leader, you know it. When you read with them, you can pick it up. When you go to their offices, you can tell, behold, a godly man or a godly woman here. And so, our joy is robbed of us by unrighteous 
leaders. Righteous leaders bring joy. The righteous leaders, when they lead, you get a just return for your labor. You get righteous people, civil servants and staff coming under them who help to give service joyfully. The service becomes honorable. Justice is done in the land. The law enforcers punish the wrongdoers. The courts dispense justice to the downtrodden. Correctional centers truly reform the deviants. You go to commit and you come out a better person. Currently, fellows who go to jail tend to come out more hardened than they were when they went to jail. When the leader hates unjust gain, he promotes integrity all around him. Whatever you might want to say about Kebake, it is said that uh, when he came to power, some fellows who come from some place on the eastern side, who work with the government in power, and they know how to oil their hands, it is said that one or two of them came to him, now he's dead so he cannot confirm, I can only say this is part of the vibe we have picked along the way, and they had briefcases of money. And Kebake called the finance minister and said, some money has come, take it and use it for the good of the land. Within no time, they knew Kebake doesn't want to be given money. It is said that some fellows went to him to ask for favor when they were in trouble. Kibake says, Kama kunashida, kama hiyo unasema, mutu anatafuta wakiri. <laughs> if you have trouble as you are saying, what you need is not a presidential discretion, you need a lawyer. So that you pursue your justice in the right place. Never underrate what a leader can do if he has virtue and has values. The public delight in the leadership of the godly people. Somehow God endorses them and brings a blessing to the nation. And every time we have an opportunity to choose leaders, this is what we should be looking for. But what happens when we choose wicked people? The passages we have read also outline the price of having bad leaders, the outcomes that come. They say the people mourn. The people mourn if they have wicked leaders. The people groan if they have wicked leaders. The weight of governance and the burden of finding the bottom, bottomless pit of greed and corruption just weighs very heavily on citizens. Their soiled relationships become now a project for Kenya, rather than solving our problems. Because I honestly believe that Ruto needed to spare us the ignominy we are seeing with the impeachment of a deputy president who he chose. And people are asking, we have so many problems. How can impeaching of a deputy president be our priority? That you want to hold the whole nation on such a Shallow thing. Kidiku is better. We were told that he was recommended before he chose a deputy. So do, does that mean that the people who are advising him were smarter than he is? So that he has to discover two years later that Gashagwa was a person you cannot live with and you must go with the one who he was offered and he rejected. <laughs> And while that is happening, the Kindiki who was an angel is the one who presided over the abductions and the killing of Gen Z's. Now if you give him more power, <laughs> if he is confirmed, at least Gashagwa talks. 
with a loose tongue and says things that we cannot live with. Kidiki does things that hurt and offend. So how are you going to balance that? And the president has just this capacity to choose characters who, when the public evaluates, they have questions. Impunity increases when you have wicked leaders. Because the weak, the poor, the disinherited, the dispossessed, the sexually harassed, the victims of extortionism have nowhere to go and plead their case. When leaders lack understanding, they oppress. And they use their power to cause pain and indignity on their own subjects those that are under their grip. Sadly, the impact and results of bad leaders when they kick in are very difficult and costly to reverse. This country has a baggage of people that came into power and did things that uh, have created repercussions, even after some of them are dead. So, you are asking, why am I saying these things? They sound very depressive, don't they? And you are wondering, how can, how can you come to church for the preacher to weigh your spirit down when it was already pretty down before you came? It is not to discourage you and make you despondent that I'm saying these things. It's to try and make a case that when we face an election, it is never a choice between people. It's a choice between values and vices. Virtues. And they represent something. And when you choose them, they are not able, even if they wanted, not to bring us the baggage that they are. And so you must discriminate very keenly and be selfish when you choose leaders. And be sure that you can say, the person you have chosen, you can take to the bank. And the last time when I spoke about these things, I said, once the nominations are out, do your due diligence. Hardly do the people we elect come and do anything that is very strange from what we already knew about them or what was in the public domain. Gashagwe is supposed to have fleeced his uh, brother's family. Now, the governor of Nyeri, his brother, when did he die? He died before the last election. How can they be discovering now that he's such a bad character, he freezes his sister-in-law and his uh, nephews and nieces, if it is true? Is that information to come and tell us now? You can ask, where were you that time? What due diligence did you do? So we know these people. Maybe they are like us a bit. Is it, could that be true? That they are like us. Because people choose people who are overall generally like them. <laughs> and Christians have a way of saying, let them choose the people they want. God will take, take care of it and sort it out down the road. Now down the road, he may take a bit of time before you sort. Don't create a problem for him to come and solve. He has enough problems to solve without you adding another one. You remember Moseven during the COVID days, one day he had a clip that was circulating. He said, you got to think that God is idle. He has so many problems solving the problems of the world. You got to shouldn't be creating problems for him. You know, Ugandan idiots should not be creating problems for him to solve. That man can be very philosophical. <laughs> this country will only change when good leaders offer themselves for election and when citizens accept to choose good people and overcome bribery and the mischief that goes with it. It is to let us know that when we choose people, 
we mostly lose our power to contain them. And when they use their discretion, we have no power of the people that they choose to work with them. Today I don't want to dwell very much on the solutions. I'll do that in the days that follow. But I want to say that the chapel can seek to mature in appreciating this thinking. And like salt and light, we can exert our democratic influence to pursue authentic, credible, godly, and wise leadership when opportunities come to elect people. Lorraine, you know I'm saying this subject should be discussed a little more frequently than now. I do not know that there is any other society except the church that has a burden for Kenya and would like to make a change as the church. But the church also has a tendency to sleep on the job and come very late near the elections uh, when people are hardened and they may not change. And so it's very nice midstream for us to be discussing these things. But I also want to say that where we work and trade and make decisions, you can tell that every time you exercise your discretion, you may be pushing ahead Christ's agenda or Satan's, and you may change the future of the organization that you work for either way. I would like to do a little math with you before we leave. <laughs> How many are our MPs? Do you know? In the National Assembly, there are only 349. How many do you think are worshipping in this church now, this service, accounting for them, the seats? I would assume around 1,000. <laughs> How many people are in churches today? Several millions. You want to tell me that we are prisoners of 349 people? <laughs> so that they are the ones we blame for every problem that Kenya has? I want to put to you that the 50 million Kenyans, 20-something of them adults who can work, are singly and individually responsible for some of the problems we have. The Constitution even provides for what is called public participation. Except that we don't have an IBC, you can actually collect signatures and recall your MP. Kenyans can even recall the president if they are not happy with him. The Constitution provides significant latitude for ordinary Kenyans to supervise how they are led. And when they get unhappy, they are not prisoners stuck. They can actually exercise some of the rights provided for them and make a change in the way things are done. The day a few MPs in a parliamentary term will be recalled by the people who chose them. The attitude of MPs and senators in parliament will change. Now they think there is nothing you can do. I challenge you to demonstrate that there is something you can do. And the Gen Z's are not to be ignored. They brought the country to a standstill. When they claimed to be leaderless, what else were they? Tribeless. Fearless. And they are our children. So, Lorraine, you want to say that what Gen Z's can do, other Kenyans can't? Now, Akishikana? You know, our leaders stretch our threshold for taking nonsense and operate on the edge of that threshold. We should raise the threshold of our objection and refusal to be treated like visitors in our own country by people who we gave votes, even if they paid for them. <laughs> you know, I have great faith in the church. The hope 
for Kenya is the church. It is the only place where we lead people to faith so that they accept Jesus Christ as Lord and usher in a new outlook towards life. It's the only place by virtue of discipleship where we get people who love Jesus and teach them how to honor God in their lives and to gain courage to stand for Christ. This sort of state of our political situation in Kenya is a testament and a demonstration that the church has failed in its discipleship enterprise. The church must offer those who can offer alternative, elective, and appointive leadership across the country. And wherever you are as a Christian, you must push the agenda of Christ. In the next two Sundays, I will speak about other elements of this. But today I try to set the ground for us to realize Maboni Mabaya. And we cannot sit there and delight in the privileges we have and let the country go to the dogs. Part of the other challenge of Christians is that we tend to moralize and simplify complex, grave issues and show like things are not as bad as they are. Things are bad, but things are not desperate. Thank you. <laughs>